friends. Apropos of improving the mind, you probably have often heard the question that newspaper men and journalists often ask people. Namely, if you were shipwrecked on an island and could have only one book, which one would you choose? The best answer was given by G.K. Chesterton, who said he would like to have Thomas's practical guide to shipbuilding. <laughs> I heard of a man who had been reading so very much about cigarettes being a conditioning cause of cancer that he gave up reading. <laughs> John, that was a second late. <laughs> and there was a college boy who wrote home to his father and said, Dad, I'm going to save you a little money this year. You will not have to buy any more books for me. I've decided to take over last year's courses. <laughs> One day some horsemen were crossing the desert and they stopped at Anoasis for a drink. And a voice out of nowhere spoke to them and said, fill your pockets with pebbles. Tomorrow you will be sad and glad. They obeyed the voice, and they filled their pockets with pebbles. And the next morning, when they awoke, put their hands in their pockets, they found that the pebbles had turned into diamonds and rubies and emeralds of the most precious kind. They were glad, but they were also sad. They were glad that they had turned into jewels. They were sad that they had not taken more. <laughs> and that's the way it is with education. We're very glad that we've had it. We're sad we didn't get more out of it. Did you know that there is a virtue called studiositas? In other words, studiousness. Uh, when we started to prepare this telecast, we went to Thomas Aquinas and read his treatise on studiousness. Now, studiousness, he said, is possible because the human mind is perfectible. Uh, in lower creation, there's not much perfection possible. For example, H2O can only take on three forms. It can be uh, water, ice, and steam. Plants have greater variety, greater adaptability to temperature, to seasons, and the like. And animals have still more capacity for perfection due to their ability to move from place to place. Man as the greatest of all. Man on account of his spiritual capacities of intellect and will is able to get the whole universe into his own head. He therefore is a kind of a little world, a microcosmos. And you even to grace, he can change his nature. He can cease to be a creature and begin to become even a child of God. Now, studiousness is related. You could, I wonder if you could guess the virtue to which that is related. Temperance. Temperance because, uh, Thomas Aquinas says, we have three great passions and urges and inclinations. One is to eat. The other is sex. And the other is for knowing. Everybody's curious, men just as well as women. That's the reason we hate to have secrets kept from us. We were made to know. Now, these three urges can become abnormal. Food can become gluttony, sex can become adultery, and knowing can become crime, uh, pride. Hence the necessity of temperance to prevent us, one, from having too little, and on the other hand, from having too much. If, for example, we have too little, well, then we become lowbrows. <laughs> now, a lowbrow, of course, does not develop himself. If we do not develop our muscles, our muscles begin to, to atrophy. 
And there is in us, there is in the universe, not only an evolution, but there's also a law of devolution. That is to say, we can not only go up, but we can also go back. A white fence does not always remain a white fence. Leave it alone and it ceases to be white. It may even become a black fence. Darwin tells the story of a number of pigeons that were brought by a bird fancier to a very high degree of perfection of color. And then he turned them loose on an island, went back and found that in 10 years they had all changed into a dull gray slate color. They had degenerated. So it's possible for the mind to degenerate. It has been established statistically, think of this, that 61% of the adults of the United States during the past year did not read a single book. Do you know how much time the average adult spends on television? He spends three hours and 20 minutes a week on TV. These same adults, 50% of these same adults that spend three hours and 20 minutes before TV 50% of them had not read a magazine article during the year. 25% of college students had net read, not read a book the year after graduation. Something wrong with education when it does not inculcate a desire for learning. So just as there can be low brows, so over here you can have Eyebrows. <laughs> his learning always exceeds his knowledge. Now, a high brows a knowledge is uh, generally due to overspecialization, or rather, his knowledge tends to overspecialization. He concentrates on just one thing and interprets everything in terms of that one specialty. His knowledge is not universal. I heard of a, of a young man who had finished medicine. He went home to his father, who was a doctor in a small town, took care of all kinds of diseases. And the uh, young son doctor said to his father, he said, Dad, he said, you know, we learned in medical school that this is an age of specialization. And he said, you get nowhere today unless you specialize in something. And I've decided to specialize in the nose. And the father said, which nostril? <laughs> Uh, Darwin confessed to the ill effects of specialization. He said, I spent my life in one specialty of science. And he said, I'm very sorry to say now that at the end of my days, I've lost all appreciation for poetry and art and good literature, which I enjoyed when I was young and in the university. H.G. Wells once wrote a fantasy on the moon men. We call them the sea lights. And uh, he pictured them all as developing one organ that was in accordance with their specialty. For example, those who just studied music and refused to learn anything else besides music, they were all ears. Glass blowers were nothing but lungs. And chemists had long noses. And scientists were carried around in sedan tubs. They were nothing but, but globs of intellectual jelly. And one of the, one of the uh, ill effects of, uh, of becoming a highbrow, and this is another mark of him, is he has no use for the common people. That's when knowledge begins to spoil you, when you've lost touch with the common man. Horace. The uh, Roman poet was that way. He said, I, I hate the common crowd, and I avoid them. Now, these are the two extremes of studiositas. Now, let us suppose, 
Suppose now that we concentrate on how to improve the mind by a proper use of the virtue of temperance. There are three suggestions. The first suggestion is, in all reading and in all study, taste. Look at everything you read as you might look at a lollipop. Hold it on a stick. See what flavor it has. Maybe it's not worth reading. Just think, we, we are full of hygiene laws. We have individual cups for drinking and so forth. And, and we're protected. If anything gets on our cranberries, we'll not eat them. <laughs> but garbage for the mind, anything. We'll pour in all the filth that we please. As one publisher said, when uh, someone brought him a very good novel, he said, I know, he said, this is a marvelous novel, but this year we're looking for trash. <laughs> <laughs> so you taste. Now, there are some things that are, once you taste them, you see, well, they're not, they're not worth bothering with too much. They're all right as a taste, recreational reading, Take, for example, an exclusive diet of novels and TV. When people just sit glued to a, uh, uh, to a TV uh, drama in which emotions are provoked and evoked, the emotions of love and hate and jealousy and fear and dread and anxiety and so forth, as we turn over the pages of the novel, we become more and more stirred and as we listen to the Westerner and we see that man with the white hat on and there are 50,000 bullets are shot through that white hat, all the black hats, they're knocked everywhere, but that white hat never comes off his head. <laughs> and you become so full of dread that maybe someday that man's going to lose his white hat. What would happen to the world? And what are all these emotions directed against? Fictitious characters, a book, paper, Why can't you see that after a while our emotions are like the spring on a screen door? Pulled and pulled so often that after a while it loses all of its resiliency. And then later on in life, there come real objects and problems toward which the emotions of love and hate and anger and justice and so forth should be aroused but they become so jaded, so exhausted, so emasculated by being pulled at artificially that they're no longer aroused. And that is why in the face of social injustices, dishonesties affecting one industry after another and politics, we remain cold. Our emotional life is gone. That's one of the evil effects of too steady a diet. And students, when they go to colleges, should only taste certain courses. Go in the first day. If the professor does nothing but sit and dictate notes to you, quit the course. <laughs> then there are certain courses that are not worth following. Statistics of the year. It'll be useless next year. Some courses on sociology. You could get more out of a book in a hammock in an hour than you can out of a course of that kind in six months. Taste them. If you do not like them, throw them aside. Then next, chew. When we get hold of something good, and we masticate it in order to take out of it all the flavor that is there. Now this, this chewing means that we are not always just looking at the book. We first of all have to put forth considerable effort. There is no such thing as an easy path to knowledge. Do not believe these advertisements 
learn to speak French in 40 easy hours. Calculus, learned in an afternoon. <laughs> learn how to play the piano in 10 easy lessons. Buy an electric organ, sit down, play it at once. Just try it sometime. <laughs> so we're looking for everything easy. We do not read books. We've got to get hold of a digest. Everything has to be broken up for us. We're not putting forth any effort. Uh, the other day when I came into the studio, I found a, it, a cover on a book. Fortunately, it was only a cover, but it very well illustrates the flight from effort today in studying. You know what it was called? Brain surgery self-taught. <laughs> So we are not therefore always to be looking at the book. We have to get away from it and meditate on it. Uh, what I do with, what I, with my books is when I get a book, I read it through fairly quickly. I, I underline the important passages. That's chewing out the meat. And then I read it over the second and third time. And then I will make in the back an index of my own. So that when I want to refer to those ideas, I have my own index ready. Now, you cannot do that with borrowed books. Anatole France said that uh, the only books he had in his library were those that were borrowed. <laughs> <coughs> then the third way to improve your mind is to digest certain kinds of books. Now, digest does not mean a summary. When, when there is such a thing as digestion, there is a flow of the food and nutrient value into flesh, into blood, into bones, and into the brain. When, therefore, we digest books, we learn, as it were, from the inside out, not from the outside in, not from the book in this way. We will read the book, then we close it and we try to rethink what we have read. The longer we keep our eyes on that book, the less we will get it into our head. Try to give an example of something. You never understand anything until you can give an example. <coughs> Think of the people who write speeches. <coughs> then when they've written a speech, what will they do? They will sit down and learn that speech by heart. Just think, they'll make a living mind made to the image and likeness of God subservient to a piece of paper. Why, what's written on that paper can be made better by thinking it over and over again. It's often wondered how I can get up here and talk for a half hour and not use an idiot card or a teleprompter. It's really very simple. Just simply get, get ideas into your head. Now, I brought over tonight. There is the telecast of tonight. Right there on that yellow paper. It's written in flesh and blood. And inside out. Now, I've got pyramid here. The reason I'm not touching on pyramids and on quiz shows is because I don't have time. But I don't get nervous about it, you see. I remember once asking Cardinal Mercier when I left the University of Louvain in Belgium, I said, I may have to teach someday. What's the best way to teach? He says, tear up your notes at the end of every year. And I did that for 25 years. You have eyes and I have eyes. But the light is not in our eyes. The light is outside of us. We have the same eyes at night as we have in the day. We cannot see at night because we lack the additional light of the sun. And so too, for the understanding of many things, we have to appeal to the light that is outside of us, namely the light of God. That is one of the reasons why I have in my house, I've got about 8,000 books. Our house is only 25 feet wide, and so I've got them everywhere. Now, this library here is a simulation of 
my own study. Well, my desk is here, and books on either side of me, and shelves, and then at the far end is a door, and that door leads to the tabernacle, to the chapel. And I deliberately put my desk here in order that I may get my illumination from the Lord. There's a world of difference between knowledge and wisdom. One can have a lot of knowledge and have no wisdom. You can know without being moral. In order to have wisdom, you have to be good. That's the reason never go to a psychiatrist who's divorced or is not leading a good life. He can't give you any wisdom. He can never help you. And so when divine wisdom came down to this earth, who are the people who came to have their minds improved? Two classes, shepherds, wise men. And the wise men found what every student wants, the wisdom of God. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. He was the son of a farmer who entered the clergy in 1919. And on his way to becoming an archbishop, he wrote more than 60 books and attracted a long list of followers. But most of us will remember Bishop Sheen as a television personality. In life is worth living. And now, His Excellency, Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. His most popular series, Life is Worth Living, attracted a weekly audience of up to 30 million and won him an Emmy Award in 1952. His sense of humor was definitely a strong part of his magnetism. Take, for example, this comment about his television ratings. And uh, we telephoned 1,000 men. And we asked the question, what are you listening to? 994 answered, my wife. <laughs> In 1966, Sheen arrived in Rochester to succeed the Reverend James Carney as bishop of the local diocese. Names such as Gordon Howe, Vincent Toffany, and Lieutenant Governor Malcolm Wilson were there to greet him. At his very first local news conference, he talked about his appointment. I have been responsible for keeping and helping 800 dioceses in the world. Now I will be responsible for one but I'll be much more responsible. When asked how he might handle any problems in the local diocese, he responded with a short parable of sorts. Because it is very much like a third baseman coming to a new club and you say, well now, how are you going to play the first ball? He will say, well, it all depends upon how it's hit. Hmm? Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen will be remembered worldwide, but he will always be the subject of special memories here in Rochester. The local ecumenical movement made progress by his very existence. Because of his international reputation, Catholic and non-Catholic alike claimed him as their own. No one could ask for a more fitting epitaph.